Having a great time with my friends. Traveling, Traveling through, through time, time to start again. Jesus, Buddha, Pora, unite. Help us float through time like a kite. What? Are you trying to time travel? Uh, maybe we opened a new timeline. What are we going to do? Bi-weekly episodes? Bi-weekly episodes. Mm, Bi-weekly episodes. Woohoo! Woo! <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah. I mean, it was badly acted. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, yes. <laughs> it's not so, as bad so as other usual. stuff we've done. <laughs> Imagine the smile on your parents' face as you rush to meet them at the school gates. The soft heat of the sand between your toes on a first holiday. Waking up in the haze of a late afternoon after dancing all night. The drop in your stomach when you realise you'll never hear their voice again. These are conscious experiences. Without them, what is there to life? In this sense, we all know what consciousness is. There's nothing we know more intimately, yet it remains one of life's greatest mysteries. Despite the incredible advances made in physical science, it doesn't seem like we're any closer to an explanation of where consciousness comes from. How is it, exactly, that the brain's 86 billion neurons give rise to conscious experience? As we'll see, our answer to this question will not only shape our understanding of the human mind, but the fabric of reality itself. Hello and welcome to episode 101 of the Pan Psycast. I'm the Marmite Manic Mr. Jack Symes and I'm joined once again by the great cosmic mind that is Mr. Andrew Horton. Hello. And our resident conscious pile of manure is Mr. <laughs> Holly Farley. Hello. Welcome back, gentlemen. Did you enjoy your hot girl summers? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, I did, Jack. It was very nice. It was uh, a lovely opportunity to just do whatever the hell I wanted for... Mm -hmm. A few weeks and and i didn't get to travel of course because that's still kind of a bit difficult but i enjoyed my time playing a lot of playstation reading a lot of books going on a nice walk not to catch Walks. you in a fib but you went traveling recently to scotland did some arts and crafts didn't you yeah we uh went to see my <laughs> wife's <laughs> brother up in in edinburgh and that was really nice yeah that was the first time we've been able to do anything like that in a while i also enjoyed my hot girl summer it was really good just to think take a bit of a break from work and the podcast together which is really nice to recharge the batteries so we can come back with loads of energy and give you all fantastic episodes for our lovely audience yeah so yeah very nice i'm feeling calm relaxed and obviously missed you guys quite a lot so it's nice to be back oh. in a room together recording again and uh, yeah it feels like coming home it does doesn't it uh i didn't know what hot girl summer meant when i wrote this that's the question you, you so. just read it on twitter or yeah you but saw it on, do you know do you know what it means a hot girl summer it's, no, it's about no, no, feeling confident in who you are and having fun and looking good at the same time. I mean, we could all do at least two of those things. It's hot girl four <laughs> seasons. You are, Mr. Marley. Uh, we're delighted to be back and well rested. And we're moving to bi-weekly shows. That's a new installment of the podcast every other Sunday. We've been making weekly shows for five years now. And if we want to keep the project going and have the same amount of research and energy for the podcast going forward, we're going to have to do them every other Sunday. So thank you in advance for supporting us in that. There's still going to be lots of bonus content on Patreon as well if you need more Pan Psycast. Yeah, we all work full time. So this is a project we really want to spend lots of energy and time and research into. And it's just unsustainable doing one episode a week. It's something where we've had lots of discussions about it behind the scenes. And we want to make sure that you, our audience, get the high, the highest quality stuff possible. And we just think that the best way to do that is to make it bi-weekly. Yes, you'll miss us. You won't have our lovely dulcet tones every single week. However, you can go and listen to all the other stuff because we are there forever in the ether. And obviously, you'll still have us twice a month. That's still, that's still pretty good, right? Like, your favorite show isn't around twice a month. All, all year every month right you just binge it on netflix and then move on well no not with us um you still get to have two wonderful episodes a month which will make sure are really high quality for you as well we'll still be producing stuff we're not just halving our workload and taking it easy we're going to be writing books for a series which we're going to be talking about in this episode episode 101 doing those after shows and live discussions with our audience too so we've got lots of exciting stuff to bring your way in the future including 
Ali Mali, how you thrill me. Aha, Ali Mali, Ali Mali nearly kill me. Aha, Ali Mali. Ali Mali, we've heard about you before, and we wanted to know some more. And now I know what they mean. You're like no such pleasure machine. Oh, you, oh, you make, make me dizzy. Ollie, as you know, today is Bittersweet Chocolate and Almonds Day, a time to celebrate the flavorful combination of dark bitter chocolate and toasted almonds. Mm. Many studies report the health benefits from eating small quantities of bittersweet chocolate. Mm. And as I'm sure you'll agree, the addition of almonds are a delicious healthy plus. Unless you have a nut allergy. As someone who's always looking tip top, do you have any top tips for maintaining a scrumptious healthy diet? <laughs> <laughs> a long way around getting to a healthy diet. Well, I mean, the, the standards, right? Regular exercise, plenty of sleep, eating nutritious foods, lots of vegetables, because vegetables are like the best thing you can eat, really. Those things, if you do those well, you're you're healthy, right? Do you have like a food stuff that you like, which is tasty and healthy? Something you don't feel cheeky eating? No, but it's delicious. Jack, healthy food isn't tasty. <laughs> That's not <laughs> the kind of message you want to send to our <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, uh Well, just lots. Of, I think the more veg you eat, the better. So a variety of vegetables. You don't have to be like, oh, I'm going to have some meal and some carrots. You can be like. Mix it up a bit. Have some carrots and something else. You can have some broccoli. You could have some mushrooms. You could have some cauliflower. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna, like this is, now the rest of the show is just me naming vegetables. I, I am not a nutritionist. Better than ever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a nutritional expert. No, I'm I, assuming the more veg you eat, the better. You can't go wrong with a good veggie curry, Jack. Oh. You've got the nice spices in there. You've got a nice healthy, hearty vegetable, and everybody likes a curry. Not every. No, nope, everyone likes a curry, Jack. You it can't. is the most eaten food in the UK, though. Is it? Curry yeah. is. Uh, masala, yeah, chicken tikka masala is the most eaten food in the UK. Yeah. I found out that in France, they consider tomatoes to be a... Is it aphrodisiac? Is that the right word? I mean, it okay. depends on what you're trying to say. <laughs> if, you're try if you're trying to say it, like, makes them horny... <laughs> Then yeah, I guess. Yeah, that's what but I'm I trying don't. To say. Well, I'll but... never look at ketchup the same way ever again. <laughs> but I'm not waitress. Would you like ketchup? <laughs> Any sauces? <laughs> what are you trying to say? <laughs> that sounds to me like pseudoscience yeah. BS. But I think if, uh, but if maybe we, maybe I'm wrong. If we have any listeners in France, please get in touch and let us know. <laughs> <laughs> please don't. <laughs> On our return, we're absolutely delighted to announce the forthcoming launch of our new book series, Talking About Philosophy. We've been producing this over the last year and a half. It's going to be out across the world, published by Bloomsbury, and it's a series of introductory philosophy books comprising interviews and essays from all the world's leading philosophers. So people like Daniel Dennett, Frank Jackson, Steven Pinker, Patricia Churchland, Susan Blackmore... All of the books focusing on one particular issue. So how can we build a better society? Is it reasonable to believe in God? How does the brain produce consciousness? Mm. The books are a combination of interviews and essays. So all of the essays are completely original to the books. And the interviews are based on those which we've recorded on the podcast. So we take the best parts of those interviews and completely remaster them for the written page, making the ideas accessible, easy to follow and entertaining as well, and updating them at times. The first book in the series, Philosophers on Consciousness, is now available to pre-order online. So go to talkingaboutphilosophy.com or hit the link in the iTunes description. Woo! We'll be talking about this book throughout this two-part episode. So if you're interested in the ideas or just want to support the show, then please consider picking up a copy. So once more, that's Philosophers on Consciousness, Talking About the Mind, talkingaboutphilosophy.com. Could I support like a little local business to buy the book like maybe like amazon.com <laughs> <laughs> am i able to do that yeah if you went to talking about philosophy.com yeah um do you want to do that then to go to, to oh fantastic there you are and you see there there's there's lots of links to all the different bookshops that you could want to go on i want to send more people to space more people to space yeah that's what mr bezos spends his money on yeah, isn't it? buy a book space. and send jeff bezos into space he did or, thank all amazon employees and customers for getting him to space. So if I buy the book through that, I'm helping him get to space more. That's such a worthy cause. <laughs> <laughs> Part one, the fabric of reality.
So in this episode of the podcast, we just want to discuss some of the ideas that are spoken about in our upcoming book, Philosophers on Consciousness, talking about the mind. It's going to be quite a celebration mm. of the publication of the book. Like we say, it's available to pre-order now, so link in the description if you're feeling the excitement as we certainly are. It's out on February 10th in the UK and a month later across the United States in mm. India and Australia as well. So wherever you are, you can grab yourself a copy of it. But yeah, a nice informal conversation about some of the themes we thought were interesting. Mm. Should we paint a picture in the listeners' minds? <laughs> should, we, <laughs> should we tell them what the book's like, what, what it looks like, some of the features we've, we've got in the book itself? Well, I'm glad you asked, Jack, because we actually have a pretty amazing description of the book from one Stephen Fry, of Ooh. all people. Uh, a great endorsement, and, and, and I think just, yeah, he summarizes exactly what's great about the book. So he says, Jack Syme guides us charmingly and authoritatively through introducing and summing up the contributions, filling the role of interlocutor and interviewer, dis distributing delightful inline info boxes, offering explanations of concepts, characters, and context as you read. He does so with a wit and freshness that enlivens without trivializing. It cannot be common to find Toblerones, Paul Rudd, and Adam Sandler <laughs> sharing pages with the most distinguished philosophers alive. This is a book that everyone interested in the human mind will fall on like a hungry student on a Toblerone. <laughs> It's funny from ear to ear as you read that review. Like it, first of all, like it's incredibly generous, isn't it? And really, yes. really nice. But doesn't that just capture the spirit of the podcast, the book itself? That mm. you know, we've got some of the leading philosophers in philosophy of mind talking about their ideas in an accessible way. And Adam it's done Sandler. So. <laughs> yeah, and Adam yeah, Sandler. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think if if you, if you do pick up the book, uh, you will get that. And particularly if you've listened to a lot of the podcasts as well, it will it won't feel like you're just listening to the podcast. Like the the because uh, as we've already said, some of them are actually just revamped versions of some interviews you may have listened to. But it has that same charm. Hopefully, you find it as charming. Um, and the. And it really does just for any term where you think, oh, I'm not sure about that. You can guarantee that it will be explained in really straightforward language. So if you're not trained in philosophy, you'll always know where you are and you're never going to get lost. And I just want to say when, when I was reading it, I just liked how it really felt like this ongoing conversation throughout the book. So mm -hmm. while it wasn't that all of these philosophers were directly talking to one another, is that you knew that if there was a big claim made in one of the chapters and you think oh, that was quite a big claim. I wonder if somebody has something to say about that. You're guaranteed that somebody's going to have a, a view on it that might criticize it or look at it in a different direction. And by the end, you've got this really great overview of just, as Ollie's already said there, the big problems in this topic and some of the best thinkers approaching it from different angles. So you will have a, a slice of everything there has to be said on that basic level as an introduction. And you don't typically get this with a lot of other books. And I thought that's something which when I was studying philosophy, at like undergraduate and or when we're picking up books for the general public as part of the podcast, sometimes I want these philosophers to engage mm. with each other directly. Yep. And you get that right within the same book as, as Andrew's saying there. So not only do you get like David Chalmers and uh, Galen Strawson and, and Massimo Piglucci explaining their ideas they do so in reference to each other directly in some brilliant clashes which people I remember being a GCSE or A-level student or undergraduate and loving like the clash between like atheists and theists and like proper debates and things like that and you really get that uh, in this book on philosophy of mind people like Patricia Churchland not pulling back any punches and speaking so candidly and and forcefully against the other people in the book yeah the exchange especially between dennett and strawson is brilliant and i think really fun to read those two chapters back to back where they're both claiming each other have made the silliest claim ever made <laughs> which is uh big words and yeah really lots of fun and just to echo what andy and jack have said having these philosophers dialogue with each other and actually a tribute to you mr simes as well i think a lot of the questions you add at the end of the chapters are really good as well not just for students of philosophy but actually sometimes once you've read a bit of philosophy sometimes mm. you can be a little bit lost okay i have this information now what do i do with it and i think those questions are really nice in terms of kind of funneling actually getting people to think about these thought experiments these thinkers these ideas in a more kind of deep manner with really extensive references as well so if you want to go away and read more about consciousness there's loads and loads of brilliant recommendations in there too so i think it's brilliant I don't think I think it's the best book ever written on philosophy of mind and we can just put a full stop at the end of that. 
Well, I'll, I'll <laughs> pick up on another <laughs> sentence, baby. I'm not going to reject anything you've said or be modest at all. I, I think you're right completely on the money. Uh, uh, but just to give people a, an overview of what the chapters are, who, who's written and contributed to the book, we've got Gregory Miller, who's Ooh. written uh, first chapter, and we'll mm. speak about that in just a moment. I think that's, he's got a great thought experiment in there. Susan Blackmore, David ah. Chalmers, Frank Ooh. Jackson, Ooh. Michelle Montague, Ooh. Massimo Piglucci, Patricia Churchland, Keith Frankish, Daniel Ooh. Dennett, Galen Straw, and Philip Goff and Miri Albahari. So we've got a real star cast there of all the greatest philosophers of mind who are who are out there with lots of differing views from panpsychism, panpsychist idealism to illusionism and and people just presenting the problem phenomenology. And Frank Jackson's original essay is is excellent as well. One I want to pick out there his analysis of why the knowledge argument's appealing and then how he uh, changed his mind and had a mm. change of heart. It. So mm. there's loads of great and original stuff in there. Anyway, you're probably convinced to buy the book already. So <laughs> we, we just want to have a talk in, in person between each other because we haven't actually had like a round table discussion about what you guys thought of the book and the, some of the ideas in there, what some of your intuitions and answers to some of those questions which are in the book are. So perhaps we should just kick off and to bring the listener with us here, what consciousness is I think Susan Blackmore and Greg Miller in their chapters one and two reference Nagel, don't they, in his paper, uh, What Is It Like to, to Be a Bat? So definition of consciousness? Right, well, let, let's just jump into it. So I think that there's, there's a lot to unpack here in terms of philosophy of mind. It is a very dense area of philosophy. One of the strengths of the book is it makes those ideas relatively straightforward and simple. One of the things you're going to come across if you do any philosophy of mind is it's Thomas Nagel. He's a philosopher. He's very, very famous for his work on philosophy of mind. His very famous paper, Was It Like to Be a Bat?, where he argues that having the conscious experience of a bat is almost unknowable from a human perspective because of the way a bat is a sensory experience of the world is so unlike ours, the really sophisticated sonar system that they have and things like that. I've actually got like a really nice quote here that I want to mention from Nagel. This isn't from what it's like to be a bat. It's from a short book that he's written called What Does It All Mean? Which is a short introduction to lots of different philosophical problems. But I think it's a really nice, accessible, easy way to kind of ease you into this topic about what effectively will be called the hard problem of consciousness that we'll look at in a moment. So, what happens when you bite into a chocolate bar? I want you to imagine this for me, dear listener. The chocolate melts on your tongue and causes chemical changes in your taste buds. The taste buds send some electrical impulses along the nerves leading from your tongue to your brain, and then those impulses, when they reach your brain, they produce further physical changes. Finally, you taste the taste of chocolate. Well, Nego asks, what is that? Could it just be a physical event in some of your brain cells, or does it have to be something of a completely different kind? He says, if a scientist took off the top of your skull and looked into your brain while you were eating the chocolate bar, all they would see is a grey mass of neurons. If they used instruments to measure what was happening inside, they would detect complicated physical processes of many different kinds, but would they find the taste of chocolate? It seems that they couldn't find it in your brain because your experience of tasting chocolate is locked inside your mind mm. in a way which makes it unobservable to anyone else. Even if they open your skull, and this is kind of the weird bit of the chapter where he says, and licked your brain, which I think is kind of funny. <laughs> Would it taste like chocolate? No, wouldn't recommend that, guys. Please don't go opening people's heads and licking the brains. Um, he says the, the experience inside your mind is a kind of insideness. And this is very different from the idea of using physical science to look inside somebody's brain. So that's the question. You know, is there more to this experience than just uh, a physical process inside your brain? Mm -hmm. What is this consciousness, this uh, sensation of tasting that lovely dairy milk? Yeah, in, in simple words, Nagel would say there is something that it is like to be a being that is tasting chocolate in that moment. And I believe Greg summarizes it in his chapter where he says that like, consciousness is experience. Yeah. And it's that that is what we're talking about. And of course, as Ollie's just said there with Nagel, is that well, at least some people argue no matter how many brain scans you do, you're never going to actually capture that experience. Uh, I'm looking at the same paragraph from the first chapter from Greg there, and it's a, it's a great definition, some beautiful examples in there too. But one of my favorites was when you think about the ending of your favorite film or how many bald men you know, their <laughs> 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 conscious experiences too. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> so in Greg's first chapter, chapter one of uh, Philosophers on Consciousness, Greg answers the question, why consciousness matters? And I thought this was a really important question to ask at the start of the book, because I don't think it's unreasonable for us to, to ask it either. There's a lot of speculative, mm. hypothetical philosophy, and people say, oh, th these questions don't really matter. Mm. Put it to Greg, so why do they matter? 
And in answering that question, he devises a thought experiment in, inspired by Robert Nozick's experience machine or pleasure machine. So he says, in the same laboratory where they came up with Nozick's experience machine, the scientists invent a zombie implant chip. Now, a zombie is a philosophical, hypothetical creature which is physically identical to you in every single way, mm. but they're not conscious. Mm. So you could have this chip placed into your brainstem and you would be physically identical. You do all the same things, but you just wouldn't have conscious experiences. You wouldn't have that what it's likeness to be. you. You'd still eat chocolate, but you wouldn't have the experience of the taste of chocolate. And Greg says, the scientists trying to convince you to have the zombie implant, say to you, you can have anything that you want. Do you want trillions and gazillions of pounds? Do you want to <laughs> have the best chefs in the world make you food? Do you want to go climbing all over the world and have a perfect mansion and all of this wonderful <laughs> life? And he says, would you take the zombie implant for all those things? I guess we'll put the thought experiment to, to you guys. Would you take, is there any circumstance you would take it? What What's your price? Well, Greg has said in that chapter so far that consciousness is the source of all value in the world so if you are going to take this zombie implant which sounds great right i i love trillions of, of dollars i like a big mansion give me blue skies and a beach to myself sounds great but if i had no conscious experience then all of those things would have no value to me whatsoever i'd effectively be like a, a hollow shell of a human being i'd have no i wouldn't be able to reflect and be like huh i really like this beach I'm going to go spend this money. I would just be like a almost some form of a robot. Mm. So I guess the instinctive response is no, I wouldn't have the implant because all of the benefits I would get from having it, I wouldn't be able to experience and appreciate. Well, I would I would go as far to say that once you put the chip in is that any any inner sense that of yourself vanishes in that moment mm -hmm. in that I cannot separate myself at least in some metaphysical sense from the desires and the experiences of what it is to be like me so you take that away then any idea that i'm being motivated by something after that point i don't think i could even say like, there isn't a sense that i could have a sense of integrity where i say these are values that i have and i want to live a particular life now of course the zombie me might still live by those things but to say that the zombie values those things and that's why they do them is no longer a thing so of course in which sense then if i felt like i wanted to live a life well no i would not for this it would be effectively me dying in that moment mm. yeah i think you could almost get a, go a step further and say actually if you did take that away from someone that would be a really big moral difficult decision to make it'd be hard right apparently did you guys know this i was reading this thing the other day about bears did you know bears can appreciate beauty yes i saw this yeah show. right so apparently they've, they've done these like experiments on bears and they like look at sunsets or they kind of sometimes just sit and like are content in themselves mm. which is also ador adorable i mean that's let's get out <laughs> that's that's real cute even though the guy could like maul your face off or whatever um but yeah, if you took that experience away from a bear, I would say that's you're taking the core essence of who they are away, and they're not even a human being, right? Yeah. So actually, if, if someone was going to do that, even for all of the money in the world, uh, it wouldn't be worth it. I think you both right. That that's one of the first things that Greg takes from the thought experiment, isn't it? He says Nozick says in his experience machine example, if you get into the machine, have the perfect life, said Nozick. Actually, no one would do it because that'd be a form of suicide. And Greg says that's even more true in the case of the zombie implant. There's no mm. inner light there anymore. Mm. Just as we'd say someone that sits on the couch and watches television all day and doesn't go out and do anything, the zombie implant would be akin to something like that. You're not really living mm. a life. Just on that point, is, is this presupposing that sentience relies on consciousness? So could I have, could I be sentient without the conscious experience so technically speaking zombie me still might have preferences in, in some basic sense that it wants to avoid mm. being out in the cold yeah um and rather be nice and warm mm. but doesn't have any values about those things outside of the immediate impulse yeah i, I guess they wouldn't have the values because they don't have the there's no what it's likeness to them they're just sound waves and scribbles aren't they they don't mean anything so you can you'd still respond to your environment you just wouldn't have any inner experience there'd be nothing in your cartesian theater yeah. nothing on yeah. the in your mind's eye when you undergo those experiences because yeah, you, you're not undergoing them yeah because greg uses the examples in the chapter doesn't he of like jokes poems and music mm. and how often our reactions to these things are normally quite immediate right no one really sits down and goes 
well, actually, you know, was that joke funny? I'm going to have to think about it. Like, no, laughing is, you laugh at something normally. Sometimes it comes later, but it's normally pretty immediate if you've ever been to a comedy show. So actually, if there's nothing inside of this, what it's likeness, then yeah, you, you don't have, there, there, is, there is no value in anything apart from just existing and sustaining your own existence. Well, I wonder if that's uh, true, because those are the two big questions for me at the end of that chapter, which is one of personal identity, which Andy's already mentioned there. Is there an alternative theory of personal identity which could say that even if you are a zombie, you're still the same person or like continue to exist through time? And secondly, whether or not there's more to consciousness to being an ethical subject or something different from that. Because David Chalmers in the next chapter says as well, no, I think if you're conscious, then you're an ethical subject. Mm. You matter morally. Mm. Greg says the same in the first chapter. Mm. And Goff says something later in, in the penultimate chapter. But I wonder if there's a, a separate account perhaps we can we can bring in. I think there's there must be a grain of truth to that in at least con consciousness is the first i think the very first step to being of moral concern in well in a particular way in that without consciousness the whatever object that we're examining has no interest at all and mm. surely on a fundamental level ethics is about taking account the interest of other beings in mm. the world so without that first step it would make no sense to speak of ethics at all would it i wonder could you have like a, a view which incorporates non-conscious things so people think we've got like responsibilities towards the environment and and towards yes. concepts like species without but, but particular yeah so there you could you could say long term so uh, i was reading a little bit i didn't finish reading it all so I would, something i would go back to but people talking about long-termism and saying that yeah, people are valuing the, the abstract concept of a species over mm. necessarily just individuals i think that idea could be quite problematic in its own right it's not the discussion worth having right now I would always say that those things only become important because they are affecting something that we have with a conscious experience. Mm -hmm. So the species is a collection of conscious beings who are affected. Likewise, when I, 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 I shouldn't not care about cutting down trees because they might lack consciousness or it depends on who you're asking, I guess, but because of how they affect conscious beings mm -hmm. that can be affected by that destruction of the environment. And you can bring it back to humans as well. So human beings have like a, so there's some circumstances where a human being isn't conscious, but they're still definitely a moral or you know ethical subject. You know, if someone's in a coma, for example, mm. you know, debates about euthanasia and passive euthanasia, they have the potential potentially to become conscious again. You know, we're going to be horrible to those people. It's that famous great philosophical question. Why don't you just swear around your baby? swear around your baby like the baby doesn't know baby's like not doesn't have that level of conscious thought yet but people are like well no you shouldn't swear around your baby anyway because they have the potential to become a, a moral subject where you know if you're just effing and blinding and jeffing <laughs> around baby Susie baby Susie might start doing that as well a very inappropriate dinner party so I think that the, the potential point's important and actually there are some states where people aren't conscious but they're still definitely uh, ethical and moral subjects. But, mm. but on both of those accounts what matters is the fact that they will there is a potential for a type of consciousness that means that we should care about it yes. if we have somebody who's in a coma and they're in the coma for 50 years and then the doctors say actually we now can conclude yes. that there is no yeah. chance yeah. of this person ever becoming conscious again we wouldn't treat them in, in a, as a moral subject in the same way as we would do that somebody who's you know, just been in a car accident and can definitely feel the pain and everything that goes with that yeah the, and this comes through the book and through some of our previous interviews on the show and, and ideas that listeners will be familiar with so susan blackmore's illusion of continuity mm. saying that we don't even have that continuous idea of self that stream of conscious thought that we think we do and or galen strawson saying does he say that like there's like 10 galen strawson's like mm. every day or few hours <laughs> when you fall asleep i die and things like that but Greg's view is akin to Barry Dayton's view, who's referenced in that paper, which is what makes me me over time is having the same capacity or power mm. for consciousness, which is essentially what Andy's saying to you there, isn't it? Yeah. And I, and I think even, even if you were to take the Strawson account um, where my future self might very well be a different self is that I still don't think you could still hold on to some sense of continuity or even just have, I think we talked about this on the episode where we discussed anger and we're saying how psychopaths l cannot really envision, or at least this was a theory of the of the author of saying that they, they cannot see themselves in the future as being the same person. Yeah. So they almost lack the empathy for themselves yes. there. In which sense then, even if you didn't actually believe metaphysically that you are the same self 
20 years down the line is that you could still be very invested in making sure that whatever conscious being that is in the future like might benefit from things you do right now <laughs> not so i don't think it makes too much of a difference practically speaking on how you might try to live a good life let us pause for a moment to say a quick thank you to all our phenomenal patrons for making the show possible in particular a very special thank you to the man whose leather jacket collection rivals that of david chalmers it's mr adam cool he pities the fool who denies the reality of consciousness it's mr t he's not a philosophical zombie he's a very naughty boy it's the life of brian ramirez round and round she goes in a cartesian circle it's lily hooper his favorite phenomenal experience is on top of a bakewell tart it's andrew cherryman if you want a solution to the hard problem of consciousness vote pedro living his life by the silliest belief anyone's ever held it's saint david legionnaire eating cheese is the most vivid conscious experience a person can have so says john breeden <laughs> the man who knows what it's like to be a goat it's john gautier enjoying a show at the cartesian theater it's steve fun langberg show him your pineal gland and he'll show you his <laughs> <laughs> It's Michael Kissley. Breathing new life into the mind-body problem, it's Jamie Lung. Broken down on Descartes Drive, it's Jay Wheelless. And last but not least, the man whose name is so hard to understand that Daniel Dennett thinks it's an illusion, it's Maron <laughs> van der Kolk. If you're enjoying the show, then please head over to patreon.com forward slash pansycast to show your support. A link is also in the iTunes description. Right. Let's jump back into the discussion. Well, continuing that discussion then on being an ethical subject, in mm. the third chapter of the book, David Chalmers uses a couple of variations of the trolley problem. Mm. The first variation he uses is there's a runaway trolley hurdling down the track and it's going to run over one conscious normal human being mm. and on the other track there's five philosophical zombies identical <gasps> physically but they all lack conscious experiences mm. and he asks us what we would do presumably you're gonna flip the switch and kill the kill the zombies rather than the one conscious human as a, a the train's straight, coming straight, andrew you yeah so as, 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 a, as a straightforward <laughs> intuition i would save the conscious person mm. but it, it i guess the if you wanted to be more utilitarian about it and you had time, then you could at least ask questions about what these non-conscious people contribute to whatever yeah, yeah. society the they're can in. They suffer, but Andy. if um yeah, but but even if it's even if they personally can't suffer, they might provide a lot of services that make a lot of people happier. Drive um, HGVs. So HGVs. <laughs> but zombie army of HGV zombie. drivers. I mean, that's but what, we need. what I would but my my kind of initial intuition is is that the lives that they have are going to be less important to them than mm. the person who's on there and also the types of relationships that they're likely to foster with other people are probably going to be quite limited as well mm. so i'd save the individual yeah i think if if we were saying that the zombies are an exact replica of a human being apart from they don't have the what it's likeness of experience so yes i mean i think it's pretty obvious isn't it you'd save the person who would have the experience of dying horribly in a trolley accident i, over I, I can think, talking I can about think of an episode once like how many dogs would you drown yeah <laughs> that was um actually and the funny thing about that example is and i, I wish i could remember it the name of the author example, the question, how but many the, dogs would you drown right, for but, the, but i when i was reading through the example i misread it and i thought that the person oh, proposing God. the example was sort of saying we can't say there would be that many. And actually the person was saying there is no limit to the amount of dogs he would throw out of, a, out of a raft to save a human. So like theoretically he would throw out a million dogs. Who was the person? I can't remember the name. The name was. I, um, and I just well, thought like, the RSPC, but, yeah, but right. like, but, but if, <laughs> according, <laughs> according, to, <laughs> according to that logic then, because I assume he would say something very similar about the zombies is that yeah, you yeah. could have a uh, infinite line of those zombies on a track and yeah. the train will just run over all of them and it would still be better to save the one. I, I, I suspect that a lot of people would probably feel quite similar to say the example of, of a robot mm. where they might very well appear let's say in the future very advanced robotics that, that they might appear like they are human beings but they lack consciousness and they lack the ability to have values and mm. people are not going to feel as bad about treating them particularly badly 
and then the big ups rising happens and we all get <laughs> attached to pods and live in the matrix so that's fun <laughs> i've just got this idea of a train running over an infinite line of these zombies it's certainly make train watching a little bit more fun though we've <laughs> got a variation of that trolley problem uh, in the chalmers chapter as well in which he introduces an extreme version of mr spock from star trek mm. and says that there's this other philosophical hypothetical creature called a vulcan they're conscious but they can never experience happiness happiness, suffering, pleasure, or pain. Every conscious experience for a Vulcan is entirely neutral. So now the choice you face is either killing one being that can experience pain and pleasure or kill five conscious Vulcans who can't. So the train's holding down the track, one conscious creature or five Vulcans that can't experience pleasure or pain, but they have conscious states which are neutral. Which one do you I think? So just just before I know this is being an annoying philosopher here, so I'm I'm going to not answer it's the question. It's a fast train. How unlike no, you? Uh, so <laughs> I just wanted to to at least pose the question of whether or not such a thing could even be feasible at all. In mm -hmm. the could could you have a conscious being and let's say like, like a Vulcan who could live quite a complex life? But if you if everything was truly neutral to something, I'm just wondering whether or not just the way that motivation works, and let's assume that some, some evolutionary reason for this could be posited. Well, I, I'm just wondering whether whether or not such a being could even function properly without any real emotional pull. Like uh, basically, the the question is is that if they can simply just reason and be logical, how could they even function to begin with how could they become such complex beings yeah first i think there's some contributors to the book who would put that a little less politely like, yeah basically say like this is complete nonsense yeah. and like so you're asking me to pick a make a decision on a thing that just seems to be well massimo piccolucci puts it in his chapter like if, when you talk about these hypothetical creatures mm. you're not talking about the real world yes. mm. in which we yes. exist in which biological creatures evolve to adapt mm. to their environment yeah and pat church and just says just because you can imagine something doesn't mean it's right. true and, 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 yeah. and that, there might be something very much to be said about that but i'm just i'm just thinking yeah in, in the in the way in which any being could be motivated to and to have interests i feel like some emotion is so important there so that's my roundabout way of saying that I'd probably still lean towards saving one person than five Vulcans. Well, Chalmers would probably say to you, it's not whether they could survive in society, which you should be concerned with. Um, it's just whether or not it's conceivable that a creature could be conscious without undergoing happiness, pleasure, pain, etc. Yeah, can and I, I think you you can get your head around that idea. Like you've had neutral states of conscious experience in which you're not feeling pain, pleasure, happiness, suffering. That feeling of you know, I might of, call it neutral because it doesn't feel like it's pushed to a particular extreme like i could be content and not describe it as happiness but i might describe it as happiness when i compare it to standing on a nail so the it always has a qualitative aspect like a, um, it always has like a value or a i think i think that the in a moment of reflection i could always attribute a value to whatever state i'm in now i think if i'm in the process of flow i might not really think about mm. what qualitative value i would put place on it and and maybe sometimes it'd be largely arbitrary but i think you could describe any particular state that you're in as mm. being at least slightly preferable or less preferable well, take just the isolated conscious thought one plus one equals two and just think of the vulcan having experiences mm -hmm. which are purely like that for, so for and you, i'm saying no... if you if, if everything was like that is that I'm I'm asking the question as to whether or not you could do anything in the world. So let's say you could, because you might say, well, what about robots? Could they not do something? But they've been programmed by people who do have values to achieve a particular end goal. I'm just not sure whether or not it makes sense to talk about any animal that could function yeah. like that. Like mm. the emotions come first and then the logical part evolves later as a way to solve the problems of the lo of the emotional pull that it's trying to achieve. <laughs> <laughs> but Vulcans are aliens, right? So even if an alien can't feel pain or pleasure, would they still have moral worth? Now, my temptation is to say, yes, I think they would. Their own existence is their own existence. That's, that's worth enough in of itself. Would I say, though, that in comparison to a human being that has conscious experiences like me, I think it's a bit of a misleading thought experiment isn't it because i'm the i'm gonna go with the human being that mm. has the same conscious experience as myself what the, the the discussion you're having is about trying to figure out the what it's likeness of a vulcan which 
you can't experience and you know you can almost use the speciesist argument right you could say well you're probably going to be more inclined to identify with the conscious experience of some other being similar to you than an alien that you don't really understand slash can't even hypothesize thinking about well Chalmers thinks you wouldn't do that he says it would be monstrous to divert the trolley to kill the five Vulcans. He says, quote, what matters here is not the capacity for happiness or suffering, but something much more basic, the capacity for consciousness of any kind. Consciousness alone, that's what gives creatures moral status. Now we just need to figure out which beings are conscious. So I, I yeah, I wanted to, I'm glad you mentioned that, and the fact that when I'm saying I would save something that i felt more guaranteed and it's linking into what you're saying there is i feel i feel like i have a stronger guarantee that the life i'm saving of a particular human has a rich inner experience and and all of the things that go with that and so i i have more confidence that my choices is, is at least going to positively impact that person but that doesn't rule out the, the idea that the actual like a conscious thing it would be more important like so if the choice was those vulcans versus the zombie then i for me it would be almost a no-brainer of saying that i would save the the conscious being over the thing that lacks consciousness Mm. entirely Mm. again because they have some sense of interests um going back to the stuff we were talking about with the animal rights stuff is that whether or not we can describe anything as being ends in themselves but if there if there are such things then consciousness clearly is a big part in guaranteeing that something can be treated as an end and not just as a means. And David Chalmers thinks we're both monsters. That's that's fine. It, it, you and you and Andrew, yeah, yeah, yeah I yeah. think so. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't. I'd I'd, <laughs> I'd I'd kill the one one person. So my my virtue knows no ends. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you a grand so. claim. <laughs> <laughs> So continuing, let's go back a little bit here then. So in between Greg's and Chalmers' chapter is Susan Blackmore's, who gives us another thought mm. experiment, which is the Conchi zombie one, which listeners to the podcast will have remembered. So she says, imagine at some point back in history in our evolutionary past, we had two types of creatures, Conchies, ordinary human beings with conscious experiences, and zombies physically identical in mm. every single way to Conchies, but they don't have these inner experiences this what it's likeness this consciousness Mm. they don't have minds let's say blackmore says there's no reason why evolution would favor conchies over zombies so it's absurd for us to think that it has some kind of evolutionary function as a lot of people in popular writings on the topic seem to assume any thoughts on this because this is a thing that goes right through the book doesn't it through uh, chalmers and it goes to piglucci goes to pat church and it's in the strawson chapter it's everywhere so yeah Yeah, i think this is one of the most interesting threads throughout the book i think if you walk up to the average materialist non-religious person and say what is consciousness what is this experience that what is this likeness they're probably going to say something well there must be some form of evolutionary explanation as there is for most other human faculties and body size and shape etc there must be some evolutionary reason why we have the what it's likeness Mm -hmm. right there must be some whether it's like being able to detect color for like certain berries you should or shouldn't eat or whether it's being able to taste something to nutritional worth and value like it's no coincidence i made the joke earlier about healthy food doesn't taste very nice but (laughs) foods with like high amounts of like fat sugar and stuff that you know our bodies uh, wouldn't have been able to encounter regularly you know Mm. that's what binging is right you get that stuff and you're like oh my god fill my belly with that please so i was always kind of of that mind because i think the first time we had a conversation jack about consciousness i remember thinking well there must be some evolutionary reason why it's there so i think it's quite interesting that kind of sue blackmore says well actually no there is no evolutionary advantage to conscious experience that doesn't sit quite well with me I, that I, why else would it be there mm. why else would there be a conscious why, why else would a, a a bear be able to appreciate a sunset or a any form of animal you can imagine. I like that bear. Octopus, right? You think of the amount <laughs> yeah. of they've done these intelligence tests on, on octopuses and their incre- incredible amount of sensory information and experience they can have. Why, why wouldn't it be there? Well, it's interesting because that's one of the books that Susan Blackmore takes issue with, a popular book by uh, Godfrey Smith on other minds, the octopus and the evolution of intelligent life. Mm. And so she says books like this assume it has an evolutionary function, which... Yeah, she says there's no other evolutionary reason why it could be there. Uh, any thoughts on this, Andy? I have a really difficult time separating kind of the emotional ex- inner experience from just consciousness itself. So when somebody says you could lack consciousness and still successfully navigate the world in a mm-hmm. way which then 
allows a species to propagate of course you can like plant life i guess the actual the idea that it can survive without being aware is clearly possible mm. but i don't know how at least with the types of social beings that we are without having that kind of inner awareness i'm not quite sure how things like human beings could exist because surely part of the ability to be a social animal and let's say like the freudian superego of being like had this inner experience of being able to experience oh i know what the taboos in my society are i can self-regulate and i know how i can behave in front of other people for my own benefit and for theirs without having consciousness there i don't know how a species like us arrives to the point where we're at now now mm. could you have some other type of being yeah sure but i'm not sure if i could meaningly talk about things that are like humans without consciousness mm -hmm. so whether or not then consciousness evolves as part of a social experience or i don't i mean i'm thinking this is complete pure speculation i do not know enough about the science of the evolution of the mind to be able to speak meaningfully on this but i'm just throwing that out as a as an idea is that like i'm not quite sure how we would even arrive at this idea of zombies and that maybe consciousness is part and parcel of the evolution of yeah. the type of animal like we are hmm. yeah uh, so as we get into the middle of the book we've got an original essay from massimo piccolucci and mm. then the interview with patricia churchland i may both take issue with susan blackmore's uh, thought experiment and just a quote from piccolucci clearly the ability to rapidly sense environmental changes such as shadows and colors as well as changes to the animal's constitution, such as pain, is advantageous in terms of survival and reproduction. Mm. In human beings, additional advantages probably include the ability to deliberately plan our actions, running mental stimulations of possible alternative outcomes. It is also possible that consciousness is required for the evolution of language. Pat Church says something so much, says, if I'm not conscious, I can't talk. There are lots of things I can't learn. I've seen patients in neurology clinics without consciousness. They're in vegetative states or comas, and it should not surprise you to know that they do not show any behavior. So that more hard-nosed approach mm. of, no, it must uh, have a basis in evolutionary biology. It's a biological phenomenon, a, a function of the brain. And so we don't need to radically rethink our theory of the universe. We just need to find its place. Yeah and uh and explain what where the illusion comes from for people like frankish and dennett i need to do more reading on just the more in-depth parts of of all these topics on consciousness i guess i'm in agreement as far as that seems to be the most fruitful approach of just at the moment of trying to at least figure out at least how the brain might go about producing something we might call consciousness now that might mm -hmm. not still explain exactly what consciousness is but it's at least a route to take um, rather than just getting to that point where we're left with these big questions and we're not quite sure what the best approach is to solve the problem. Yeah, and it's interesting, isn't it? Like, I like Jackie. I quote you directly from the introduction to the Pat chapter. You say her witty and no-nonsense approach, which I think is a very polite way of saying that she's pretty damning of a lot of the, the philosophical work about philosophy of mind, and she sees it as a complete waste of time, that actually the philosophers have created a problem for themselves that they're trying to fix. But actually, from her perspective, learn the science, do the science, and see what happens. So she thinks that, you know, maybe at the moment there might, there's a problem that we can't quite figure out how bits of the brain work. Just do more science, less philosophers, more neuroscientists. We do enough research and we'll be able to just explain it one day in the future, potentially. Well, we put that quote from Patricia Churchland to David Chalmers in the book. And he says, quote, we should certainly learn the science, do the science, see what happens. And that's been central to my own approach. However, one thing that becomes really clear once you know the science is that it's not getting us a whole lot closer mm. on the hard problem right mm. now. And then Strawson and Goff take issue with uh, Pat Churchland's purely neuroscientific approach in the book. Mm. Yeah. I, and I think there are a lot of listeners might feel very in tune with, with, they're, what they're saying there as far as can be quite frustrating when you're hearing philosophers talk about an issue and you're left with these big questions. But I think with some of the other things that we've been treading upon here are still important discussions of um, philosophically, I mean, it's the only way you could approach it is how important, ethically speaking, for instance, is consciousness to a, to a discussion. And of course, you're not going to figure that out scientifically. So there are always going to be elements of this discussion that I'm going to have to come back to certain things about how we value the world and how important consciousness is to that discussion. Hmm. Just a couple of last things to finish up on as we're talk, talking about them now rather than saving them, bringing them randomly in the next installment. I love the one line paper that Pat Churchland wrote for the book originally. And I quote it in the book itself. 
And so I asked Pat if she'd like to write a short essay explaining her thoughts on some of the leading theories in philosophy of mind when we were putting this text together. And she agreed and, and wrote the paper and got back to me in record time. And it was just one sentence and it read, here is my one line paper. Without data, you are just another person with an opinion. <laughs> Yeah. She she's yeah. used that line yeah. uh, a number of times, and I do quite like it. I it's do just like this, it as well. Yeah. The, <laughs> so she is, she refers to uh, she she called panpsychism pancrapism in the book as well. So <laughs> most panpsychists agree most panpsychists agree that it's not testable in principle. It's about as plausible as pancrapism, which is just as untestable. <laughs> yeah, she has that thing about false of falsifiability as well. Yeah. She talks about the idea that you know you can create any wacky theory. Whack quote I'm quoting now wacky theory like panpsychism like how can you prove it's not true you can't well I can literally invent a million other theories just the same right yeah I, I mean we don't want to open this whole can of worms but presumably the answer back to that from someone like Goff or Strawson is just that actually like physicalism in itself is also <laughs> physicalism can explain crap like, yeah, yeah, yeah yeah but it can't, it can't describe the underlying <laughs> metaphysical reality in which crap arises <laughs> But it can't explain your experience of crap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Dennett uses another parody, doesn't he? Pan niftyism. Pan -niftyism. So I wonder which one's more plausible, pan crapism or pan niftyism out of the two? Is everything uh, crap or everything nifty? Well, nifty sounds better. Yeah. I quite like yeah. nifty. If you're an optimist, it's that. If, although you if you're ask, a pessimist. Although if you ask Dennett, that's There's question. two types of people in this world, <laughs> pan niftyism. <-ness. laughs> yeah. yeah. Schopenhauer is a pan crappiest. <laughs> Machiavelli is a pan nifty. Yeah. <laughs> if you ask Daniel Dennett that question, you'd probably just stifle a yawn. <laughs> <laughs> and, and lastly, the, on the topic of evolution, um, Strawson uses this nicely in his chapter and, and says that evolution needs some kind of basic building blocks to work on. So we need some kind of rudimentary consciousness which was already there from the beginning in order for it to form these more interesting complex minds that we find in human beings, birds and mammals and mm. all this other stuff. If you haven't already clicked the link in the iTunes description or went directly to talkingaboutphilosophy.com, I don't know what you've been doing. You could say it's a bit of a mystery. Months off <laughs> and I'm still not interested. <laughs> the Mystery Philosopher. Welcome to Mystery <laughs> Philosopher, gentlemen. You excited? Yeah. 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 You sure? Yeah. Sure. It's been a while. You, uh, Andrew, historically, you seem to pick up the, the points here. After a nice little break, though, Ollie, you could storm ahead. You could be the new champion is, of the quizzes. Yeah, this is well, se season two, uh, we do 100 <laughs> episodes. Yeah, after the last 100 <laughs> episodes, I think I lost pretty much every Our single... last five years. <laughs> but now I'm bringing it on the uh, dark horse. So the mystery philosopher is someone who is in the book. Okay. Ooh. Think about what happens when you have a conscious experience. When you're biting into a Marmite sandwich... Watching a seagull fly towards you, and kicking a lamppost in anger because the seagull has flown away with your lunch. When you undergo these experiences, lots of things happen in your nervous system. Buzz. Go on, Ollie. Mm, I'm going to go with Jack Symes. It's not Jack Symes, oh, no. It's... I'm going to go Michelle it's Montague. It's not Michelle Montague. Did you guys read the book? <laughs> yeah, I, got, I read it a, a while ago. That's a vivid example. Gregory Miller? No, it's not Gregory yeah. Miller. I'm just going through the, uh, the <laughs> names now. Um, <laughs> Name well, drop more, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Philip Goff. <laughs> no, it's not Frank Jackson either before you said. Uh, Dan Dennett. No, it's close uh, to Dan Dennett. It's Strawson? No, oh, God. It's Keith Frankish. Hey, Keith Frankish. Sorry, Keith. <laughs> we did really enjoy it. Be be beautiful prose and everything, but I uh, I couldn't care less. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to this and so on the Fan Psychos. Tune in a week on Sunday for part two or join us on Patreon already because it's already out. No, sorry, you're right. Sorry, ignore me. I'm, Do you get I'm in the mix in the schedule? I'm very slow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you're trying to understand a week on Sunday? Because if I'm you don't get it, I'm worried the listeners won't. Trying to imitate a conchie. <laughs> <laughs>
or hit the link in the iTunes description. To find out more about the show and get all of our old episodes completely free, you can visit thepansycast.com. From all of us here at The Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That was great. That was really good. You guys really read up on this. That was good. Wow. (laughs) That was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're doing a wonderful thing with this. (laughs)